Ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, we want to thank uh, the Vice President of Amazon, Mr. M uh, Misner, for addressing us. And we want to take a shift for a bit and talk about Europe, Europe and the Middle East, Europe and Israel. And to open and to begin this discussion, we wish to invite the EU Special Representative for the Middle East Peace Process, without further ado, Her Excellency Ambassador Susanna Thurstall. Madam Ambassador, the floor is yours. Yeah, no, I can have to read. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, as I was born in a country that lies below sea level, it feels familiar today to address you about navigating stormy waters. In fact, in my current role as the EU Special Representative for the Middle East Peace Process, I do this every day. Navigating stormy waters is a difficult endeavor and not without risk. With the right leadership, good instruments and some luck, it is possible to reach the shore safely. I'm an optimist and can only do my job because I believe that peace in the Middle East is possible. And the European Union will do everything possible to continue to support this. Today, as we discuss how changes in Europe will affect Israel, I will focus on three points. First, we need to understand change in the EU in the context of continuity. Second, I will address how this change in continuity affects the role of the EU in the Middle East peace process. And third, I will discuss the strength of the relationship between the EU and Israel which we can build on together. Change in the EU is and always has been rooted in continuity. And the root of that continuity is that the EU was founded on the principle of the rule of law. The European Coal and Steel Community was founded in 1951 after the most devastating war. Our leaders were convinced that only a lasting peace based on cooperation and interdependency would create trust and would end our security concerns for good. As part of the second generation born after the war, I still feel grateful for their de decision that allowed me and millions of others to grow up in peace. But even as our peace was codified in international law, we can by no means take it for granted. Our society is constantly changing. Inequality, demographic changes, migration, climate change, and terrorism are some of the underlying currents that lead us to float into stormy waters. But as every sailor knows, at sea, the sun is not always shining. There will be storms. The question is whether we will deal with them with the same wisdom and based on the same values as our founding fathers did in 1951. Otherwise, the ship will sink. For this reason, the P European Union will continue to work to protect fundamental human rights, freedom, democracy, and human dignity in Europe and across the world. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to my second point the role of the EU in the Middle East peace process. Here too, our founding principle remains to protect fundamental human rights of both Israelis and Palestinians based on international law. I remain convinced that, like in Europe, this is, only viable, this is the only viable solution to address all security concerns. Only this road will lead to sustainable peace. Since I started my role as Special Representative almost one year ago, I have spent a lot of time visiting European member states to discuss their views on the peace process. And I admit, I was worried about what I would hear and find. But wherever I went, 
north or south, smaller or bigger countries, I heard support for the two-state solution based on the agreed parameters. This is the mandate I took with me to Bahrain last week, where the US vision on economic development of the Palestinians was presented. Together with representatives from member states, our message was and is that the EU is ready to look at proposals that improve the economic situation of the region. In fact, some of the projects and topics proposed in the US vision are already being implemented with support from the EU and other donors. The EU has contributed over 10 billion euros towards peace in the last decade. However, the EU remains convinced that economic development can only work if it is accompanied by a viable political process agreed by both parties. And in fact, the two-state solution is also the only solution that still enjoys majority support in both Israeli and Palestinian societies. There is no alternative that would lead to a long-term peace for the generations of Israelis and Palestinians to come. At the same time, both Israelis and Palestinians are saying that the two-state solution is dead and that we need another, maybe one-state solution. To them, I would like to ask one question. What is your vision? How do you envision such a state that can meet the aspirations of both the Israelis and Palestinians. A single, binational and democratic state from the Jordan River to the sea is hard to imagine. One state with unequal rights for Palestinian citizens would be undemocratic, unjust and unstable. The status quo is not the most Israel can achieve for f future generations. Both Israeli and Palestinians owe it to their children and their children's children to end this waste of resources and protect human dignity. That is the only sustainable solution. The EU does not intend to replace the parties and to come up with new proposals or solutions in the Middle East peace process. Safeguarding international law is in the interest of us all. Israel, Palestine, the countries of the region, but also for the EU and its member states. My third point is about the relationship between the EU and Israel. Contrary to most perceptions, the EU-Israel relationship is flourishing. There are many historic, political, economic, social, and cultural connections between Israel and the EU. As both the EU and Israel navigate stormy waters, we need to use this strong relationship as an instrument, like a compass or a lighthouse. It is far more difficult to survive a storm on your own. That does not mean we have to always agree, but we have to focus on our shared values and objectives. We have to listen to each other's concerns. One of those concerns is the security of Israel. Israel is in a troubled and often unstable region. To take this concern serious is the only way to reach the shore safely. Let me state it clearly, the EU is committed to the security of Israel. It was an honor to address you today and to be part of a program so full of prominent Israeli and international thinkers, politicians, realists, and idealists. As I said in the beginning, I'm an optimist. After all, the saying is that after rain comes sunshine. Who would have predicted what happened with Egypt 40 years ago, only six years after a dramatic war? The Egypt-Israel peace treaty has set an important example of how Middle East peace is negotiated and by what means Arab and Israelis, Israeli interests can be accounted for in the peace process. 
I am confident that the relation between the EU and Israel will continue to flourish thanks to our joint efforts to reach a just and sustainable settlement to the conflict affecting this region. We believe that cooperation, diplomacy, democracy and international law will bring about a more stable and peaceful region. We believe this because this is how we found peace in the European Union. And we believe that future generations of Israeli and Palestinians will be able to live in peace and security. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank Ambassador Tursell for her opening uh, address. And as we set the stage with several additional uh, chairs, um, I would like to introduce and welcome the session on a changing Europe and its implications for Israel. First, uh, His Excellency Dr. Emanuele Joffre. Uh, ambassador and head of the delegation of the European Union to Israel, uh, Dr. Konstanz Sterzemüller, uh, the Robert Bosch uh, visiting fellow at the Brookings, or senior fellow, sorry, at the Brookings uh, Institution in Washington, Ambassador Ron Brossol, who heads the IDC uh, Talia's Abba Ibn uh, Center for International Diplomacy and is a former Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and now Ambassador to the UK and to the UN. And last but definitely not least on the speaker's side, uh, Ambassador Dr. Odede Iran, um, who is with the Institute for National Security Studies and former Ambassador of Israel to the European Union, NATO, and to Jordan. And they will be moderated by Barak Ravid, uh, the diplomatic commentator correspondent of uh, Channel 13 News. Barak, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, everybody. We, uh, I'm told we don't have a lot of time because afterwards uh, we have, I think, Yair Lapid who's coming here. Uh, so we'll try to do this uh, panel very, as, do it a very dynamic uh, panel. Uh, so I have just a very short very short opening. I will start with a, a statement that might surprise uh, many of you. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Israel and the EU are going through a honeymoon in uh, their relations. I know it's not uh, something many people uh, think, but I, I'll tell you why. Because the EU just uh, in the last few years stopped being an irritant to the Israeli government. So when you don't have a problems with the, with the EU is not irritating anymore, you can have a uh, uh, a honeymoon, and this honeymoon has several other uh, reasons. Uh, first, I guess you noticed uh, the EU is in, has quite a lot of domestic political issues. Um, uh, Brexit, for example, um, a lot of uh, um, uh, member states that are not really in line with uh, Brussels, like uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, um, uh, Germany that is going through a political uh, transition, France that has a lot of uh, domestic uh, political problems, uh, all of those weaken the EU ability to influence uh, foreign policy in general in the world, and specifically here in the Middle East and on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which also uh, a weak EU is very good for uh, the Israeli government, which uh, allows this honeymoon uh, to continue. And another reason is the Trump administration that, uh, let's say, doesn't see the EU and Europe uh, in general as, uh, as very important or thinks that uh, it needs any input from, uh, from Europe. And when this is the, and with the current uh, relations between the Trump administration and the Netanyahu government, this also, I think, um, promotes this honeymoon between Israel uh, and the EU. Uh, and I will go to you, Ambassador. I'm sure you will agree with my analysis. 
Well, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Barack. Uh, first of all, I have to say that in Israel there's a tremendous interest for the European Union, much higher than in many other countries. Uh, sometimes this interest is positive, sometimes this interest is negative, but certainly the EU is very much in the mind of the Israelis. Uh, now, what is happening within the European Union? Because you refer to our uh, internal dynamic. We just got elections uh, in May. Uh, the turnout was 10% higher than last time. Uh, according to the Eurobarometers, 63% uh, uh, of the Europeans are for European Union membership. And this is the highest grade since 1983. And mind you, in 1983, we just had nine member states. Uh, the, uh, parties that won the elections uh, are mainly the, the Liberals, the Greens, but also the traditional parties, Social Democrats and uh, Conservative, all solidly pro-European. Europe uh, has been uh, uh, overcoming its uh, economic crisis. We are on the path of uh, economic growth. Unemployment is decreasing steadily everywhere. Uh, we've made the fight against climate change a central piece of our work. Uh, we have now started to work on defense. Uh, the European defense uh, uh, is now uh, developing. In the last three years we made tremendous progress, uh, the highest progress, the largest progress since 1952 when the, the European Community of Defense uh, was uh, uh, shelved. Uh, so uh, Europe is uh, a, uh, a, an island of stability in a way if you look at the overall context. The topic of the discussion today is navigating stormy waters. And in fact, the waters are pretty stormy indeed across the world, and we heard it uh, extensively these days. Uh, despite all the waves that are reaching the uh, European continent, we are an island of uh, relative stability compared to the rest, and we are projecting this stability also elsewhere. But, but Ambassador, let me just stop you here. You know, I'm covering this thing for almost 15 years now. And if you talk about stormy waters, EU-Israel relations used to be very stormy and created a lot of work for me. And I have to tell you, I'm a bit unemployed these days when it comes to Israel-EU relations. And I'm, what I'm trying to understand from you is if you agree that the reason for it is that the EU is less of a player these days. No, I disagree that it's less of a player these days. I think this year we have elections in Israel twice, uh, election in Europe once. Uh, we're still in the middle of that. There's a, there's a process that is going on, so I think we, this is also uh, as implications on the way we interact with each other. When was the last and time the EU high representative visited this country? Uh, the last time the high representative visited this country was about three or four years ago, uh, before I came. Uh, certainly is this, this is not a normal situation. Certainly the political dialogue uh, at the high level is not as, uh, uh, as productive as it should be, but the Prime Minister of Israel visited Brussels at the end of uh, uh, 2017, which was, was the first time in 20 years that the Prime Minister of Israel was visiting uh, uh, the European Union institutions, so I think this is quite significant. Uh, Europe has been uh, um, uh, exercising an influence in the region that perhaps people don't see, but uh, if you look at the Syria crisis, for example, and the effect the Syria crisis had on its neighbors, and who did uh, took measures to uh, stabilize those countries like Jordan that uh, uh, received an influx of refugees, it was mainly the European Union. We, we spent huge amounts of money to provide those countries for their stability, and this is certainly something that is important for Israel. It's very relevant. Uh, the, the, the action of the European Union in providing support to the country of the region, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, uh, and of course the Palestinian Authority, is very relevant for Israel, it's something we shouldn't be underestimated. Okay, I want to go to Ron Poisson for a second because I see Ron here, I don't know if you see it from the audience, he has his uh, um, ironic smile on, 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 on his face, and I, I know why. First of all, I have to tell you, Barack, I usually don't agree with you, but this time around, I agree with D you. Don't, don't get ahead of yourself. No, I, Wait, I, I, I have, uh, I have yeah, a lot of things for you. You know, the public might, you know, not understand this. But if you look at Europe, and you basically say, the Europeans usually love saying, Barack, we want to be players and not just payers, okay? That's amazing for Europe. Now, let's see where the European Union is basically a player Lately, in conflicts around the world, are the Europeans really players in Syria? Are they really players in North Korea? Are they players in the Kurds? The bottom line is that the Europeans are not players. Why aren't they players? Okay, They're not players because at the end of the day, when you really have to really pull together 
and do something, the European Union folds. You know, if diplomacy was poker, they would fold every time their hand because they are not really players. And they're not players, and I served, you know, in two European capitals, by the way, uh, the one, the other one, the queen has still not recovered for my departure. Uh, look what happened. You see, look, they're doing an uh, exit. But I always thought, you know, that Europe in the sense was, uh, had the pretense of really trying to do the following. One was really important, human rights. The second was values of democracy, Barack. And the third, mostly trying to support the weak against the strong. Now, look at a certain country that we see in this region, you know? A country that, of course, has a very bad human rights record, a country which is basically not, clearly not a democracy, and a country that is, of course, not weak, strong. Surprise, surprise, I'm talking about Iran, okay? Now, I, I, thought for it, a second, I thought for a second that you were talking about Saudi Arabia, Israel's ally. No, but you know, here I'm talking about Iran. No, for a second now, I just on thought... on all those categories, you know, as they say, no, 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 no on all categories. So basically, I remember when I was still young, you know, there was a song, shame, 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 shame on you. And I'm looking at it and saying, and I hear, you know, the European Union is committed to Israel's security. Really? You think there's one decision maker in Israel that really thinks the European Union is going to come uh, to Israel's aid somewhere in the region? You know, I mean, it's good. Seriously, Ron, it's we good. have to look at the European Union in the sense and say, look, there's a reason you don't have a Neville Chamberlain School of Diplomacy. In the okay, it's you good know, that you raised this issue. There's a good issue. reason for it. Because I have another follow-up question for you. Please, um, Now I see you with the hands No, up. no, no, I because I, I, I remember that, you, that what you just said, you wrote in an article several years ago, and back at the time I wanted to uh, write a, a rebuttal and I forgot to do it, so now I have well, my let's chance. Let's do the rebuttal now. Yes. Um, but who, then I who talk is, about my article. Uh, well, uh, we don't have time for that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just trying to remember who is, where, where in the world is the country that provides Israel with nuclear submarines? Maybe it's in Asia, this country, maybe. Who are the countries that sent thousands of soldiers to Lebanon to be a buffer between Israel and Hezbollah I think they're from Africa, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, thank you. Well, and, 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 and. Yes. Who, who is this organization yeah. that behind the scenes, that when you went to the UN and talked against UNRWA and the need to close down UNRWA, your colleagues behind the scenes went to the EU, to Brussels, and asked, you know, the Trump administration stopped giving money to UNRWA. Can you please give money to UNRWA because we need it? And they did. Thank you for peacekeeping forces. So let's talk about UNDOF, because UNDOF, you have European countries in UNDOF, right? So since 1974, as you know, we have UNDOF forces up between Israel and the Golan Heights. Basically, the most important thing that they had to do in the last 35 years was to save a goat or a cow from barbed wire on the Golan. No, but suddenly, this is, suddenly, the, what my shooting. question Wait to you is, Ron, Ron, no, my no, question to shooting. you, so, you're, you know, Austria, you're, Austria, Austria but, is a you know, serious force. In, in Israeli, Austria Israeli Austria policy, said, wait a second, said, Israeli policy go back to is, can, can, can I repeat from the UN, I will be from the UN and set a peace with you. Look, my question to you, and Israel's security My question to you. we were waiting for the my Force question to you, but to why? Come to protect us on the north. By the way, you know, but you know where they came from. You know, you know where they came from. Austria. You, yeah. No, you know, after the Austrians left, you know who came instead. No. You know, the Irish. The okay. Irish, Last time I checked, they're in Europe. But my question to you is yes. fine. I'm going with your line. Yes. So why aren't you just telling them? You know what, guys? Thanks. We don't need it. We don't need. The third, we don't need, we don't need it. We don't need Unifil, we don't need Undov. Don't come here, don't give us third of the price of the submarines from your taxpayers' money. Don't, uh, uh, don't, uh, don't do anything. Don't pay for the occupation anymore. Why aren't you saying this? Why aren't you really standing behind your ideology? Well, first of all, 
when you, now seriously, when you try and analyze it, and you look, Barack, beyond the issue of, you know, now scoring points, there's no doubt that when Israel, and you could make the economic argument, the academic argument, Israel's culturally the hinterland, and uh, in the sense in Europe, so you can make a lot of arguments, but when you enter the issue of being a player, you have to be able to really have both sides feel that you're really uh, trying to be constructive and not just one-sided. And when you look at Europe, you basically look at Europe sleep, still floating on the gondolas in Venice from the Venice Declaration. We're in 2019 now. Europe has changed. The Middle East has changed. The world has changed. But the policies that Europe presents haven't really changed. This way, you won't make a difference. OK, so let's move to you, Constance. I, what do you make of what the ambassador said and what Ambassador Prosor has said? I, I have the genuine feeling right now that you don't really need me, that you can do this <laughs> Europe, anti-Europe debate on your own. But OK, let me try. Uh, I'm actually grateful to you, Barack, for making some of my points, because I think the ambassador does know better than he says. Um, but let me put it. I'm going to agree with you and surprise you and say the following. Um, I think that it's absolutely fair to point out that Europe often appears to be politically a shambles. You can see that right now with our attempts to appoint a new uh, EU, EU governance structure, okay? Um, you can also fairly accuse us of having, of struggling to deal with the populists and the authoritarian in our midst. And that, of course, undercuts the legitimacy of the European project. Fair enough. Guilty as charged. Um, and probably you don't like the JCPOA, which is why you think the JCPOA isn't actually a European achievement of diplomatic unity. Fine. The one sort of piece of evidence that I will I th think that you forgot, and that might be relevant for Israel indirectly, is the fact that Europe is incredibly important in holding together the sanctions consensus against Russia. And that that has had a significant impact on Russian aggression within Europe and within the European projects in all sorts of ways. And that yeah, but Constance, you know, we like the Russians effects. now here. Yes, this I know that. I know that. But I think that that has knock-on effects on the stability of, of Europe and thereby on, on the stability of its periphery. But let me make one larger point before I stop, which is in the current strategic framework of great power competition, the thing that you and we in Europe have in common is immense fragility because of our geopolitical situation. Real estate is everything, right? And Europe's borders, you just have to visualize a European map if you would. It's land borders and it's sea borders. They are practically indefensible. So are yours. That means that allies are everything. That also means that the way we handle our internal affairs is everything. And I will say I've just come back here for the first time in five years, and I've never seen speakers and participants in this conference so worried about how we handle our internal affairs, yours and ours. The degradation of our political, of our constitutional orders, if you will, our operating systems. And that is what gives us effectiveness and legitimacy elsewhere. That and our alliances is what gives us power. So don't underestimate that aspect, please. And it's something that you and we have in common and we ought to work on together. But, but what do you think about the fact that the current Israeli government, uh, as a policy, mm -hmm. uh, is aligning itself with the most racist, xenophobic, and heinous governments inside the EU, as the Orban uh, yes. government in uh, Hungary, uh, the Morawiecki anti-Semitic government in Poland, and other governments and other uh, xenophobic and racist parties in other uh, EU member states as a tool to divide the EU from within in order to uh, support Israeli interest, Israeli government interests. Two words, tragic and scandalous. But then the White House is doing the same thing. That's our problem, okay? Now, I'm not saying that I think we have to make a distinction between the Hungarian government and Hungarian civil society, and even more in Poland. I make that distinction in America as well, where there are many, many friends of democracy. And in America Israel today, too. And in Israel too. 
I think that these countries are resilient democracies. But I also will say to you, I watch this very carefully because I've been living in Washington now for four and a half years and I also travel a lot in Europe and elsewhere. And I see institutions and civil societies getting exhausted, tired, becoming depressed. And what I worry is that we will reach that point of learned helplessness, as psychologists call it, where we give up because we're tired of fighting this all the time and then the oligarchs and the authoritarians take over and the result will be a disaster for us all. Oded, I want to go to you now <clears throat> because I think you have maybe the longest perspective on, on EU-Israel uh, relations here. Um, what do you, how do you see it from the time that you served in Brussels to, uh, to today, the, the, the whole dynamic? Uh, <clears throat> when you started, Barak, by saying that there is a honeymoon between Israel and Europe, I thought that there is a problem with my hearing. Uh, and because I don't remember any period in, uh, in which relations were more frozen than the current uh, situation. Uh, uh, you spoke about the high representative Mogherini and the predecessor who uh, do not visit Israel. Uh, you spoke about the internal problems in Europe, and you are right, but let me say the following. Europe will recover from this situation. They will solve one way or another the Brexit issue with Britain. Uh, in November, there will be new political leadership in Europe. Uh, hopefully, they will choose strong leaders uh, including for foreign policy and defense issues. You're very optimistic. Uh, I'm uh, optimistic for Europe, put it this way. And uh, look at the results of the uh, elections to parliament. The right, part, right wing parties won, the left wing parties won, at the expense of the, both the conservatives and the socialists. This is not good for Israel. And without a change in the current situation uh, in the Middle East between us and the Palestinians, I think that we are going to have even more frozen relations than we currently have. But maybe this, and is what the, maybe this is what the Israeli government wants, basically. No news, good news. And I think that this is a short-sighted policy, and I disagree with my friend Ron. Uh, yes, the, all the weaknesses are there. I remind you, Ron, the major trading partner is still Europe. Don't underestimate, you said interland. Don't underestimate this notion that Europe is our interland. And I take the audience and ourselves to the current situation with us and the United States. This is a friendly president. I'm not so sure who is going to be the president in two years' time, and I take you to the uh, deteriorating relations between Israel and the Jewish community in the United States. What I'm trying to say is don't throw Europe uh, to the way to the sidelines. Europe will be in the future a major element in our strategic view. And from this point of view, I've, I'm, I'm sorry to say that my prime minister is wrong. When he goes to forge alliances with parties inside the EU, I'm not against this, but not at the expense of maintaining relations with Europe uh, and the central bodies of Europe in Brussels. We will need Europe when, whenever we have some sort of a political process between us and our neighbors, not only the Palestinians, Jordan and Egypt uh, as well, and sometimes in the future, Syria and Lebanon, we will need Europe. 
And the way we are conducting our relations today with Europe is not a very constructive and far-reaching uh, site of uh, Europe. Yeah, um, Ambassador, I want to go back to you exactly on, on this point. How do you see, how do you see, and how do, do people in, in Brussels see, again, the current policy of the Israeli government to try and divide uh, the, um, uh, the EU from within by aligning with the Eurosceptics? First of all, Barak, if you allow me, one word on security, because I think this is an important topic for, for the audience. The EU is starting to develop a security policy and security means, but it's, it's very new. Member states are the security uh, provider, and, and member states provide security to Israel. You've mentioned a few things. But I think it's also a mistake to look security in narrow terms. What is security? If you're poor, you have no money, can you buy something to defend yourself? No, you can't. So what the European Union does by having a free trade agreement that is functioning very well with Israel and providing 34% of Israeli exports are going to the European market is, pro is contributing to the security of Israel through its prosperity, number one. Number two, Israel, inno the innovation capacity, the R&D, they've been built uh, also thanks to Europe. We've been uh, cooperating on R&D since 96. Israel has been part of the uh, framework program for research and development. In the last seven years, in the last five years, about 180 million euros have been given to Israeli companies to develop their ideas, and we offer the market to market this, this, uh, these goods. And then this, the, the threat of tomorrow is not only about uh, rockets and tanks, it's also about disinformation. How do we handle this information which is undermining our own democracy, which is our own security? Well, I think Europe is trying to provide some, uh, some answers. Israel is providing cybersecurity uh, capacity. All this is about security. All this is about security. Let's not forget this. And Europe is on the top of these things with Israel, and we try to look only the hard security. Israel has good relationship with the, the 28 member states. Uh, they have developed uh, relations with uh, bilaterally or with group of countries. I think that's great. Uh, all member states have good, thriving, developing relations with the European Union. Um, Israel is often a topic in, of discussion uh, among member states. There are different ideas, but I think at the end of the day, on key issues, there's unity among your member states. And this is a little bit uh, uh, perhaps uh, where we are unable to make progress because uh, uh, the, the unity is on, on, the, on, on an agreed position that have not changed. They have not changed. Uh, and a more positive attitude towards uh, the European Union uh, is probably what we need. I think it's important that we don't fool in a self-fulfilling prophecies between uh, the European Union and Israel by uh, criticizing each other and try instead of, of pointing on the positive aspects of our relationship because we, the more we talk negative, the more we think this relationship is not important. But, but it's not the, important but for ambassador. Israel, it's not important for the European Union, which is the country. It's a very important relationship. So I think it behooves on all sides to be able to look at the positive uh, aspect of this issue sides. and discuss the disagreement we have, and certainly we have disagreement we shouldn't underplay. But Ambassador, do you see what the Israeli government is doing again to try and divide the EU from within as interference in domestic political issues within the EU? The Israeli government has its own relationship, bilateral relationship with country, and they have their own dialogue, and the countries are free to decide on how to factor this in. I don't think we want to prevent a member states who have a dialogue with a third country. This is not what the European Union is about. Member states continue to have their own views. Uh, what is important is that within the European Union, then we manage to, to reach uh, a consensus on what is important. And I have to say that on key issues, we remain very united. But the problem is how we can bring the things for, uh, further, uh, how we can create a but, dynamic which allows... But you're not united. Just several weeks ago, you could not get a consensus within the EU member states in New York around a statement regarding, I think it was the Golan Heights recognition by the U.S. Okay, why? Because is, the Israeli uh, ambassador called his Hungarian counterpart, told him, don't join the consensus, as he did not join the consensus. He did not have one. We had a statement on the Golan Heights. But it was not in consensus. Yes, it was. Th that's it's not Golan. what the Hungarians said. But just, Constance, I see that you, you want I, to... I, I think we've, we don't need Bibi Netanyahu to divide us. We can do that on our own. <laughs> but, um, but the truth is also that it is really bad for Israeli soft power, for an Isra Israeli prime minister, 
to be to publicly have this kind of relationship with somebody who is not just an authoritarian ruler, but who has destroyed representative democracy in Hungary. That is not good for Israel's reputation in Europe. And I say this, and, 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 I, and, and honestly, I mean, it's, it's worse than that. It's disastrous. And I say this because at the same time, our civil societies and our economies have really close relations. At any given time, 20,000 Tel Avivis are partying in, Be in Berlin. I mean, okay, that's maybe sort of a very specific case of civil society contacts, but you know what I mean. There is immense affinity. We have Jewish communities flourishing despite the anti-Semitism that is there. I'm not, I'm not denying that, but they are also flourishing in Europe that is as it should be and as we want it to be. And it is not good if your prime minister publicly enables and encourages somebody who came back to power on a blatantly anti-Semitic campaign. That's a disgrace. And I, I literally don't understand why anybody in Israel accepts it. You know that Ron uh, was the victim of uh, some of what's going on with uh, xenophobic and racist uh, parties in, uh, in Europe because you were, you were caught on camera with Marine Le Pen, right? It's true, that is true. You always uh, find ways to put me in a good light. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I, I want to react to quickly to things that you said. One, Germany stands out in Europe as the country that basically, through years, has contributed to Israel's security, but it stands out uh, clearly at the EU, has to be said. Second, uh, on the issue of uh, countries, I want to focus on the issue of Poland that you mentioned, and I absolutely agree that Israel cannot turn a blind eye to its history, to what has happened on European soil. So completely on this. But so so Netanyahu's can, decision to sign the deal with Poland was a, was a mistake? To, to, to widen Israel's uh, relations with countries uh, all over Europe is absolutely legitimate. And like the ambassador said on a bilateral level, we have to make uh, the differentiation on not closing an eye for, because of realpolitik to the issues that you mentioned. So, so the deal with Poland on rewriting the history of Poland's role in the Holocaust was a mistake? Absolutely, absolutely. So in the sense, there's no doubt about that. Thirdly, Bart, on the issue of security, I won't budge on this. The European Union, in contrast to the United States, to the Arab League, it still differentiates between the political arm of Hezbollah and the military arm. It must be a British invention. No one can invent such an idiotic idea. But in the sense, this allows Hezbollah to gather in Europe to really have the oxygen and the finance to really fight, and that the Europeans shouldn't tell us afterwards, oh, we were so, so, you have a, you have a way to contribute to really making sure that maybe the next war in the North will not happen. It's a European responsibility. And fourthly, Barack, at the end of the day, on the issue of uh, Europe's stance towards Israel, I want to bring you something which I think all the Israeli public, no one, no one connects to this. And I'm not bringing it back, and I'm not using all my UN arsenal. Second, 22nd of May, and you know it, World Health Organization, a, a body which is a professional body, decides to basically say that Israel is the only country, to denounce only country in the world that creates health hazards in the region, also in Syria, Israel with the amazing health system, okay? Who votes for denouncing Israel? Not Syria, not Venezuela, not Yemen, France, Spain, Belgium, Switzerland, and, and I don't know, I forgot another country, okay? This is a shande. You know, how can you, how can you do that and then expect the Israeli public I mean, what have you drank? What whiskey from Scotland have you drank? Yes. As long as it is Scottish. I think you want to reply. Uh, not, look, not, not on this particular point. I, wa I actually wanted to come back to your point on Auburn, if you want, um, if I may. And it's this. There is, it seems to me to be a, a, a somewhat unhealthy focus 
on Muslim violence against Jews in Europe and, and violence perpetrated by refugees. And I'm not saying that doesn't exist. But the thing that in Germany, and thank you for praising Germany, but we have a real problem with right-wing extremists, right? We just had the first political murder by a right-wing extremist uh, on June 1st at close range, execution style, and it has been found out on, I think, Tuesday, sort of nearly a week ago, that, that he was executed by a, by a right-winger, a known neo-Nazi. Now, what I want to say to you and after that, by the way, the, the, the interior minister came out and said, we have 24,700 right-wing extremists that are prone to violence in all of Germany. That is a really shocking number. And I have to tell you, everybody, everybody who enables the people who are trying to normalize anti-democratic, illiberal ideas, neo-fascist ideas, is encouraging this kind of atmosphere. None of us should be shaking these people's hands in public. None of us should be having diplomatic relations with them. I'm sorry. Oded, I want to go to you. We have uh, several few minutes left, and we didn't really touch uh, the issue that um, Ambassador Terstal spoke about before the, this panel uh, on EU's role in the peace process, Israeli-Palestinian peace process, because, again, this is, as I said at the beginning, I think this was the main uh, irritant in the relationship, um, and it seems that today the EU is totally uh, irrelevant uh, to this issue other than the fact that it is still paying for, uh, on the one hand, maintaining the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, and on the other hand, uh, maintaining the corrupt government of the dictator Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah. Do you think that this thing should continue, or should the EU change course? First of all, I am against the linkage that Europe does in its relations with Israel, <coughs> depending in the EU view on what happens in the Israeli-Palestinian process. That is to say that they give partially the key to the development of the bilateral relations to the Palestinians. And uh, we can, and I say that to my friend, the EU ambassador in Israel, we could develop their relations much more than they are today uh, into not being a member in the EU, but very close to this situation, which will certainly benefit the Israeli economy, the Israeli R&D development, etc. Now, uh, I take issue with the representative of the EU to the Middle East process because we have failed already five times in attempting to reach the two-state solution in one go. That is to say that unless we solve Jerusalem, we cannot solve the water problems of the poor Palestinians either in the West Bank or Gaza. And this is wrong, and this is why the EU and the US are uh, at fault because they don't want to change the paradigm. And we can solve- No, but Odette, why, you know, seriously, why should EU taxpayers pay for all that? Why? I think that- Especially that, when there's no political context. I think that because the stability of Europe depends to a large extent on the stability of the region, and the stability of the region depends to some extent, to some extent, on the Israeli-Palestinian. So if, basically what you're telling if we me. Have, Barak, if we have tomorrow a serious intifada, I don't think it's going to happen because of Syria and other issues, but if it's going to happen, this will have an impact on Jordan, this will have an impact on Gaza and what happens in Egypt, I think that this is why the Europeans are interested in keeping the stability, and they uh, they are reluctant, but, but they are but still if, paying. But there are, but Oded, if if Israeli and Palestinian politicians don't seem to be very worried from another intifada, why should politicians in or taxpayers in Berlin, in Brussels, in in Paris, in other capitals, why should they care? I hope that they don't listen to you and they continue to care. I hope they do. Be because this is, uh, it, it, 
largely influences our life. It doesn't absolve us from going back to a serious process between us and the Palestinians. No, but when you have, again, I want to make it in your life a bit harder because you're dodging... It's hard the, enough. You, but you're dodging the question. You're dodging the question. You have two governments, one in Ramallah and one in Jerusalem, that only want to maintain the status quo and stay in power and survive. That's it. That's all they want. And you want people in Europe to pay for this stunt. Why should they? Uh, I'm not a taxpayer in Europe, and therefore I don't have to uh, wrestle with the problem on a daily basis. But I would say keep the flame going, because eventually we will go back to the process. There's no other way. Uh, it's good for us. Uh, if it's good for the Palestinians, they have to decide. But I think that we need the process. And as long as there is some hope that when we have a government and when they settle, the Palestinians settle their problems, domestic problems, we will go back to a process, not necessarily on the paradigm solve everything or nothing is solved. Uh, I think that this is where we will find that we need Europe to finance water issues, environment issues, uh, economic pro uh, issues, uh, and eventually we will solve the other problems. And Europe will be and is important. Well, I'm not sure it will happen in our lifetimes, but it's always good to be optimistic. We, we could continue this panel for many, many hours, but thank you for all the panelists and thank for the audience. Thank you.